One of the key things is that when educational design a game, they try to reflect the real life as much as possible. Yes. And yes. that sucks in the real life. It's boring. You know, yeah. It's very boring in, in where you put it in a game. And once you play it once, you don't want to play it again because you have a bad gaming experience. Okay, as a game designer, when we try to design things, we want to design positive gaming experience. <laughs> Welcome to Chills with TFC. For our audience that don't know you, maybe you want to uh, give a quick introduction. Who are you? What have you done? You know, what gives you the right to sit here and talk? <laughs> okay, that, that will take a much longer time. It won't be quick. I, I'll need 30 minutes just to go through. Okay, yeah. but uh, long story short, uh, I, I guess my background is that I've been uh, in the wealth management field since 2003. So mm. I've been managing people's money for the last 20 years. I'm still doing it, but I'm kind of like doing it low key because I kind of like pretty established over the years really. Yeah. yeah, so what happened along the way was that I started to give financial literacy talk because mm. uh, I think personally, educating people is one big part of my passion. I mean, I could become a teacher if I didn't do uh, financial advisory. Yeah, so uh, what happened was that uh, I was going around the region uh, giving talks and I was like, you no, know, all these talks are boring. Let me do some workshop games. Mm. And then uh, it it became popular, so it kind of like became my trademark that when you attend a zero talk, you will play a game. Yeah. And then uh, what happened was that the whole board game venture started was like, uh, I went into uh, Malaysia to give talks and we, we were like connected with Bursa Malaysia. So that's mm. the start of the change of Malaysia. Mm. And they wanted to get some educators in to help them set up their investment clubs across the universities uh, over in Malaysia. So uh, me and a, a couple of my friends, we kind of like, Clobber together a project and we went in and I, I I was working on a mobile app to do financial literacy. So I was doing mm. something like a financial literacy game on a mm. mobile app because mm. at that point of time, it was like Angry Bird was everywhere and yeah, then everyone yeah, yeah. do mobile app. So, so I kind of like... <laughs> Everybody uh, wants to do mobile app. Yeah, yeah, it's true, there was yeah, a period of time. Yeah, yeah, that, was, that was a time, so you can guess <laughs> roughly how long, that was like 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, what happened was that we went in with the proposal and they said that, hey, uh, I, I like your idea of a game uh, to kind of like engage the students, but we want a tabletop game because they themselves have actually developed something like a financial app for mm, education. Mm, and mm. they said that, sure, I think I can, I can do something about it. And I kind of like, uh, went back and redesigned the whole digital game into a board game. And mm. then we launched it across the schools uh, in Malaysia. And the feedback was very good. And at that point of time, we didn't really thought of like doing a board game because uh, people are saying that you no know, tabletop games are dying, dead. Yeah. Uh, people are doing mobile, mobile is the next big thing. Please don't do tabletop games, you know, that kind of thing. So are they wrong? Uh, they are kind of correct, <laughs> <laughs> but however, uh, there is two trends that uh, decided made us decided to take this uh, the whole tabletop thing uh, much more seriously. Mm. Uh, the first thing was uh, what's happening over in Europe and US. So uh, there was a big wave of uh, European board games that was happening over at US and the sales in board games over there was like picking up, doubling and tripling on a year on year basis. So they are calling it the golden age of board games over in the West. And we kind of think that whatever happened in the West, sooner or later will come to the East, mm. uh, maybe five to 10 years. So we say that, okay, uh, I think that would be a big board game age coming to Asia. Mm. Might not be immediate, but we want to be at the right place at the right time when that happens. Mm. And uh, since I am also an avid gamer myself, uh, so it's like, okay, let's, let's take this more seriously. Let's start uh, working with financial uh, literacy board games because mm. at that point of time, uh, sad to say, Singaporean design games had a bad name. What's so bad about the name? Uh, like, how, okay. Why is it bad? <laughs> Okay, it's I, like Malaysian uh, Chinese movies. They have a name. They have yes, a something like that. Something like that. You know, I mean, I think this is the same problem with a lot of the creatives in Singapore, uh. Uh, whereby there is a lot of content from uh, Europe and US that a lot of consumption, especially in Singapore, whereas the local content is like it's like, like substandard or it's like a bootleg of the Western or the Hong Kong culture, that kind of mm. thing, or the Japanese mm. culture. Mm. Uh, we don't really have strong creative at that point of time. So uh, same thing with game design because when we as a Singaporean, we saw the wave in, in US and Europe, we were like, okay, let's design games. And a lot of times the games that we design are like uh, neither innovative or it neither sells <laughs> in Singapore. So, so You just jab everybody <laughs> before him. It's like not, not innovative, also cannot sell. Yeah, I mean, the main thing is cannot sell. <laughs> so so, so the, the thing is like, I talk to a lot of comic artists because when we work with artists, we also work with local comic artists. They have mm, the same problem. Mm, mm. So it's like, whatever from Marvel DCs or from Japanese uh, manga, they, they sell well in Singapore. But we, when they create their own manga, 
Sanga or Comic, uh, yeah. there's always a challenge to yeah, get yes. breaking into the market. Hey, what's that one? The Celestial something. Oh, that one. Uh, that's that the was, only uh, one that really. The, Huang, the, the, yeah, but. Uh, uh, I, for, forget, for, forget. Some, some Ming something. Yeah, yeah, yes, some, yes. Some if you remember, like put it below in the comment section. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is it Wang Xiaoming? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. If we continue, people know our age, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but you see, he 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 kind of started with uh, doing Jing Yong. Uh, yes, he, he kind yes. of like localized the Jing Yong, mm, which mm, is already mm. popular. So it's kind of like riding on a established franchise. Fair, fair. Yeah, fair, and fair, then fair. Uh, I think he did one is the Shani. Yeah, I think mm, he did mm, Shani. Mm, then mm. after that, he tried to do his own. Uh, I, I think it fizzled out later on. Yeah, uh, yeah. After a while, even that is not easy, lah. Right? It's not easy. So so it it is what it is. But but you have established yourself as uh, quite a established game development yeah, you know yeah. team right yeah. and 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 uh, for all of you tuning in uh, through youtube you know if you if you are always on our podcast great because that's kind of how we started but now we have a very big youtube channel okay so come to the youtube channel and you can see that we have two games on the table right um so you, you do you want to introduce a little bit on the games uh okay so the first one was one of the first game and the last one is our uh, COVID period game. So mm. that's why you see there's a zombie there because it's about pandemic. Okay. So the, the <laughs> so the first game was kind of like an evolution from the game that we did for the Bursa Malaysia, the, the game that I mentioned last time. And uh, we kind of like make four edition of it. So mm. the first time, I mean, I started at Vox Management. So I do services. I sell knowledge. I know nuts about product. So when it comes to product, it's another whole new ball game altogether, mm. uh, which is... Okay, so now I, I can say that I know both how to sell services and how to sell products. <laughs> okay, the first one that when we created, you know, the first time you create any, uh, you, you wrote a book or you create a game, you feel that, oh, this is going to be an award-winning game or award-winning book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when That's what everybody that first started. I think, mean, I wrote a book like also. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I did write a finance book on financial psychology also. Uh, uh, yeah, I was uh, a popular bestseller, but yeah. now it's our print. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that what happens to books uh, these yeah. days. So, what happened was that, same thing, We what happened was that we went over to Europe uh, in this one of the biggest tabletop convention in the world called Spirit Essence. And then we, we thought, you know, award winning, let's go there and uh, showcase to the world. And then when we go there, it's like, uh, it's like uh, I would say, uh, Singapore Premier League Meet, meeting the Premier League in England. Uh, yeah, uh, was, uh, was, that's, that's the kind of yeah, things yeah. that uh, that when we pull that, it's like an eye-opener. It's like we are mind-blown and we realise that our standard is way, way, way below mm, what is expected mm, of a professional game developer. Mm. So uh, over the years, we kind of learned from all the publishers that we meet uh, in the International Trade Fair. Uh, we look for new manufacturers, uh, look for new designers, look for better artists, mm. uh, no longer look for $5 uh, Fiverr artists. <laughs> Uh, no insult to five dollar five artists. Everybody gotta start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean that's a hook. It's actually <laughs> yeah. not five dollars. <laughs> the hook, the five dollars is just a hook for you to pay for more. Actually, it's true. yeah, it's yeah. True. So we engage a professional artist to to get a better level of work, and uh, we learn how to do game design for for real, for real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that was we did like four editions of the thing to make it better. But of course. Uh, later on, we dis we started to explore other genre and other themes. So the first one is uh is based on global macroeconomics. Mm. Uh, it's based on George Soros' uh, theory. Mm. Uh, and I think a lot of hedge fund managers they use uh, global macro. Mm. So it's on the idea of a market cycle. Uh, how do you uh, manage your portfolio around a market cycle? And at the same time, uh, you get to be the government, so you can get to manipulate the interest rates, uh, no deal inflation, all these kind of things. And you can of course kind of like sabotage other people's portfolio. Uh -huh. So let's say the person is like accumulating a whole lot of bond portfolio, uh, you want to push it, push the interest rate up, move it into the growth phase so that your equity portfolio will outperform their bond portfolio. <laughs> and of course, you win by earning the most money in the game. I mean, that's what a lot of financial literacy games is about anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. I mean, I, I will not be very happy if that whole thing plays out in real life, but it does. It right? does, it does. <laughs> it yeah. does. Yeah. Right, but but that, sounds, that sounds quite interesting, you know, as a, as a game to, to play around mm. and, and explore. Right? Yeah. And, and the other one? Yeah, so uh, along the way, we made another three games. Uh, one game on uh, this game called Debzilla. It's something like a RPG, uh, like a D&D, &D, where you work together to campaign to fight one big boss. <laughs> along the way, you slaughter all the small villains before you can fight the big boss. So that is a co-op game that we designed around the whole idea of like a Dungeons and Dragons uh, concept. Mm, uh, mm. So, uh, I mean... Uh, finance need not be always a competitive sport. Mm, I mean, it's mm. the best when you are collaborating and working with each other to do research, you know, and investing. Uh, yeah. Then the next game we did was crypto. So that was the 
point when Bitcoin and Ethereum came out and said that, hey, you know, uh, let's do crypto. It's a big thing at the point of time and people don't really understand what they are investing. So we kind of did like a crypto scam game whereby you learn how mining works, how the whole uh, open market works and how the scam, uh, the world of crypto scam works. And now crypto is back in. We're seeing the sales of the game going up again. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, it was dead for a while. Yeah. Then the STX happened. All this kind of yeah, thing yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah. 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 Then the next game we did was money laundering game. It's a game called Dirty Money. Mm. Uh, so it was a hot topic. I think this year also with the super big money laundering case uh, in, in, in Singapore. So at that point of time, we're saying that, you know, uh, money laundering is becoming a big topic. And we are looking, we are seeing that there's a lot of uh, talk about money laundering as, a, as an education, but it's very boring. You look at the slides and you talk about the, the usual things. So how do you like <laughs> hide your money? You know, the kind of thing, the three steps of money laundering, all these kind of things. So we kind of did a, a game on money laundering. And then the last one was on uh, zombie life insurance. Mm. Uh, I have been wanting to do an insurance game for a long time, but I couldn't find a good team or way to incorporate how actually insurance work in the uh, real life in a fun way. Mm. So when the pandemic came along and was, you know, same thing stuck at home, and then I got some time to do <laughs> game design, I was like, okay, uh, I mean, a pandemic sounds interesting. Uh, how about we do it in a way that is more fun, like zombies, you know, everybody loves about zombies. Uh, we love killing zombies and it's not so offensive. Because initially when I had my first concept of an insurance game, it's about claiming like, Real, real thing like making claims on someone who died all these kind of things mm. it's a bit morbid and uh, very morbid I, yeah. Yeah, yeah and personally yeah. I've lost loved ones mm. uh, it's not a good experience to have mm. so when you create a game uh, the idea of game is about escapism mm. you don't want people to go through real life because real life sucks Mm. That's why you play a game. Mm, 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 okay. So you escape from real unless life. Unless you treat the real life like a game. Uh, I mean, uh, that's, that's the other problem. Uh, okay, that's, that's the problem later. about that's the, the game thing. design of, a, of what we call an educational game design, mm, a paradox. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So there's a paradox between trying to imitate real life while you're trying to create a game to get out of the shitty real life. So we came up with the idea of like a, a, like a zombie pandemic that's going around and an insurance company came up with an insurance policy. <laughs> So, I mean, you can do COVID. Uh, I'm sure you can do zombie virus also. So, I mean, there's a, yeah, there's a zombie virus coming along. There's no cure yet. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, there's no vaccine yet. So, I mean, insurance company naturally will come up with new products against uh, uh. the latest uh, uh, worries that the common folk That is have. quite cute. Yeah, that yeah. is quite cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, 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 so uh, the insurance company, company came out with the three different stages of zombification. <laughs> Of course, you got zombification by death. You become a zombie, go around biting people. I mean, that's where the fun part is. Like as a player, you, you can bite other people. And uh, you have critical illness level of zombie. That means you're halfway there. Your brains are halfway rotted. And of course, the initial stage where you just go to hospital and hopefully uh, there's some medication that can kind of like stop the zombification. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the, how the game uh, goes. And then of course, uh, we have like, uh, we throw in some concept of endowment inside and we throw mm, in the, mm. the concept of investment whereby if you do investment and you invest in insurance, uh, which is a better thing to do? Because we don't want to just go full out insurance because insurance mm. is a risk, it's an expense, it's a cost. We don't want to sell the concept that getting insurance will solve all issues. It doesn't. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, so it, the important thing is that how do you balance it with investment? Mm, mm. Interesting. And, and wow, that... that I mean, listening to you talk about it makes it so much more fun than whatever that's out there. Okay, yeah, but anyway, that's, right. that's a that's a separate discussion mm. another time, right? But CEO has uh, kindly offered to give away, right? Some some of these some of these games. We just came well, yeah, with yeah, the giveaway yeah. just now. Yeah, we just came out of the giveaway yeah. before we we decided. Yeah, we decided I was just to, talking, yeah, talking about it. You want to do a giveaway? It's like, sure, oh yeah, I yeah, sure. Let's do a giveaway. So comment in the comment section. Tell us why you deserve the game and which game do you like. You know, and then uh, and then we'll, we'll we'll arrange the mechanics after yeah, this. We'll figure, out later. Yeah, we'll figure out later. You put in the comment first. <laughs> then we let you know how to win this thing. Okay, but yeah. So so I I think that's great, right? Um, but I wanted to get you into kind of dig into that game designer mindset a little bit more, right? Rather than talk about the games only. Um, like you've established, right? There are all these different games out there. Um, but when I look at it, personal finance itself is a game. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. And, and that's a fair statement, right? Yes, yeah. Right. So so I want to see how you look at this thing, mm. you know, and how, mm. how do we kind of break it down and create a reliable strategy? Because mm. creating a game is one thing. Mm. Cre then... After creating the game, you want to be able to create a strategy to hack that mm. game, right? On some level, I mm. think there's that thought. So maybe just to help our audience lay out to understand you a little bit more, how do you look at this whole personal finance game? Uh, I mean, 
the stock market is a huge game. Mm. Uh, I've traded all sorts of things personally. I've done uh, Forex, I've done options, I've done futures, commodities, stocks, bonds. Uh, now I'm into crypto. So yeah, I've been through it, done it, seen it. Uh, it's a big game whereby there are we are just a small minions uh, down there trying to grab the cramps while the big boys just control the money flows around. Mm. And one of the big things is that we need to look at the money flows and try to guess where is it going. And that's that's the whole game ball game about. It's a deduction game mm. and a game mm. about analytics and data and looking at the whole thing. So it's the same concept with designing the game. It's just that we need to determine the rules. Mm. So one of the biggest challenge of the real life and the game is that in the real life game the rules are set and you kind of like cannot deviate from it okay mm. but in the real life uh the rules are kind of like gray mm. there are rules that say that you can't do that but people are doing all the time and <laughs> praying not to get caught mm. uh, i mean one of the biggest things that we talk about the we are joking about uh, if you see uh, in u.s there's uh, like uh, the u.s senators their average return is much higher than the S&P uh, 500. I mean, traditionally, as a fund manager, trying to beat the S&P 500 is always the challenge. Mm -hmm. okay? It's always the golden grill that everybody's trying to do. But for some reason, the stock portfolio of the senators over at US, they outperform the S&P 500 yeah. by double digits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And why are they not being you know, investigated or something like that? Where else anybody like Martha Stewart you know, got, got investigated for... For, for insider trading or this kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah. there are you know other other things that's going on and they are not being investigated. So uh, it's a very grey world out there. Fair, fair. Yeah. And I love how Martha Stewart was your reference. <laughs> 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 but yes, there's the Nancy Pelosi index, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of all these things. Yeah. I mean the US people are really going cray about this. Like, yeah, right? So yeah. so they, they're really tracking it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, please continue. Yeah, that, that, that's that's a fun part. Yeah. So yeah. how do we actually make it into the game? So uh, I think this comes back to the chat I was talking about the game uh, paradox where I've, real life is shitty because you can go bankrupt in real life and that's shitty, but you can go bankrupt in a game and you have a chance to redo it again. So, so one of the key things that I remember I was sharing with you that initially when we started designing games, especially like financial literacy game, when we try to pitch to stores, they don't want to take it because they're saying that uh, educational game sucks mm. uh, and it won't sell. I mean, I kind of agree with that because uh, one of the key things is that when educational design a game, they try to reflect the real life as much as possible. Yes. And yes. that sucks in the real it's then boring you know, in, yeah. it's very boring in, in where you put it in a game and once you play it once you don't want to play it again because you have a bad gaming experience okay as a game designer when we try to design things we want to design positive gaming experience mm. meaning mm. that when you play the game you feel good you feel happy you feel excited this kind mm. of thing mm. Mm. but when you do real life most of the time uh, when you first started about learning about investing i will say that you will be reliably losing money most mm. of the time, before you start to make money mm. Uh, mm. reliably. Yeah. I, I mean, you'll make small bursts of great gains. I yeah. mean, I've been doing options, I know. Like 30-40% a month is, is exciting. Uh, you feel that you're God and you can trade for a living uh, before you have one trade that wipe you out mm. and, 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 and you have to start over again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. No, and, and actually, I struggle to break down the whole thing for somebody, yes, right? Like Because yes. there's so much stacked into it, yes, right? Yes. You accumulate a lot of layers over time. Yes. And then when people ask me, how do you do this? I was like, wow, you expect one line, set yeah, everything, yeah. right? It's going to be very difficult. I, and that's I, I need listeners... to do a five days workshop on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But <laughs> yeah, long yeah. story short, it's like we try to grip the essence, the essence of the... So we will, we will look at one, one topic at hand, yeah. like uh, global macro insurance or, or money laundering. We look, we look at the grab's essence and we look at the bad experience that if we do this as a real life gameplay, what are the bad experience? How do we mitigate the bad experience and turn it into a positive experience? Mm, yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, so for example, like in zombie life insurance, uh, you wouldn't want to be claiming insurance mm, in the game. Mm. Uh, then how do I motivate the player to buy insurance? I mean, in real life, nobody wants to buy insurance until they're sick. And then they'll start to want to buy insurance, but they cannot buy. Uh, so in the game, how do I motivate people to buy insurance? So that, this is where we come up with this uh, concept that, okay, who has the most money at the end of the day will win. However, if you become a zombie, you can claim death claim. Hmm. Okay, when you're dead in the game, you're not out of the game. Okay, because uh, technically you become a zombie and you can make money by claiming insurance. So it motivates people in trying to, I would say, get sick in a way. Mm. <laughs> Not the right way to do it. The, I mean, it's about game motivation to get sick so that they can claim insurance and they can win the game by having the most insurance. Yeah. So in the game, there's two tracks. One way is that you try to stay alive. Don't get sick. And you try to make money from investments. 
and your investment will be worthless when you're dead. Mm. Okay. Uh, the other track is that you try to get infected and you try to buy as, as many insurance as possible and then you try to make a lot of money using the insurance. Yeah, so that's yeah. the motivation which but, is but not just realistic. To be, yeah, exactly. Just to be clear, that is for zombie life insurance. Yeah, that's for, for the game. <laughs> That, that is not for your life. Yeah, that's more for game motivation. <laughs> for How do we get yeah. people to do some things that they mm. usually will not do in real life? Mm, yeah. Mm, mm. So so that's why how we gamify the, the whole concept. Uh, yeah, so we look at how do we remove the negative experience or if possible, turn it into a positive experience. And from there, they will learn in lessons in, hey, you know, uh, if I do this, how is it like in real life? Uh, would it actually pan out this way? And, and at the end of the day, it's all about creating a, a talking point among the players and how they reflect whatever they play in the game with their real life. Hey, welcome to the Financial Coconut Podcast Network. I'm your host, Reggie, aka Your Chief Financial Coconut. And if you are loving what we are creating here, like, share, subscribe, share with your loved ones, comment in the comment section below. And yeah, we'll see you for great content on Chill Swift TFC. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, okay, that's that's very cool. Uh, but I, I want to focus on all, more on the real life aspect, mm. right? And and one thing you were talking about, which the rules are very grey. Yes. Right, right. In, in the game setting, and, and that's the fun part about doing games, right? Parameters are quite clear, yeah. you know, the game mechanics is there, yeah. you play, you're done, out you go, yeah, right? Yeah. But the rules in the real world, in the personal finance, real game, are kind of great, right? Yes. I mean, you've established one of them. Yeah. Are there any other things that you would like to highlight about this grayness of certain rules? Oh, I mean, you know... If you've been at it for a long time, so I want to ask you some of these things. I mean, if let's say, if we're talking about investment or personal finance, I mean, personal finance, we have taxes, mm. and this kind of thing, uh, estate taxes, real life taxes. I mean, Singapore is actually pretty transparent. Yeah, I think uh, the tax structure is quite lean. Uh. Yeah, but of course, as a self-employed and as a businessman, there's a lot more leeway. Mm. Uh, I won't go into details. I mean, please talk to your tax consultant on this, or your lawyers on this. Oh, you can check uh, out the so, IRAS episode. We did an episode of IRAS. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, of course, legitimate ways to do it, but uh, whereas in the world of investments, uh, oh, okay. Uh, I mean, there's the IPO, there are the funds, there's a the portfolio. And there's, of course, uh, insider trading, all these kind of things. There's like uh, news, all these kind of things. There is a lot of gray areas that, of course, everybody is looking for gray areas to exploit. Because what is what is investing? Investing is basically getting data ahead of everybody else. Mm. So that's why you have all this like quant trading, whereby they just put the server beside the stock exchange yeah, and try yeah, to yeah. get that 0. 0.001 seconds ahead of everybody so that they can front trade everybody. Mm. So that is actually a legitimate way of getting data faster and ahead of time and without breaking the laws. Mm, so would you call mm. that a gray area? Technically, they are breaking the law mm, mm. because that is like insider information, although it's like milliseconds ahead of the of what everybody is receiving, but yeah. that is legitimate. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. one one way that you can kind of like front, front load the thing. But of course, if you are a uh, friends and relatives of directors. I mean, that's another <laughs> great area yeah, yeah, that yeah. is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay, fair, fair. But but a lot of US stuff. Uh, because even that whole Wall Street example, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, that's why the whole Wall Street area, the rental is nuts, right? So, I, I mean, so, even a lot of Singaporeans, they are directly investing into the US stock market. Yes, because you look yes. at the Singapore stock market, it's like, uh, the one of the most peaceful, peaceful stock market I've ever <laughs> seen for the last 20 years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been since 2003, I went through the financial crisis. I went through the dot-com crisis. In fact, I was like, I started investing during the dot-com even before I went into financial consulting. So I traded through the dot-com. I uh, went through so many things. And you look at the Singapore stock market, we are like literally a bond market. <laughs> uh, I mean, even bond market is more volatile. Like, like two years back when interest rate was like, hiked so mm, quickly the mm. bond market had a big uproar and I think the Singapore stock market was still relatively resilient mm, uh, mm. despite that yeah and it's not necessarily a bad thing it is just yeah. the characteristics of this market yeah, right? yes, and of course it depends on the components and, and all, yeah, all those within yeah. right so so that's a that's a different discussion but as a as a person that like it's so professional at games and looking at games, right? You you know that there are a lot of games out there yeah, in yes. the personal finance space, yes. right? Like there's there's and other than investing, you have things like the mouse games, yeah. you know, yeah. you, you have all these other optimizing games, you know, people trying to like 
look at cash yield and then they work them hard. It's like today it's like uh, a game. Okay, okay, you know okay. what I mean? There are all these things. And and I, I, I look at how you are reacting to it, right? I'm sure in your head, it's like, some of these games I don't need to play on. <laughs> so I, I think I've been through done that. So yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah. Mm, that's I had what, the button. Exactly. That's what that's why I wanted to ask you, yeah. right? Like, what are some of these games that people mm, are playing mm, mm, mm. that you think is a waste of your time and energy, uh, okay. you know? Yeah. I, I mean uh, in game slang term we call it meta. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I uh, mean, maxing uh, to get the yields and all these kind of things. I've been there, done that before. Uh, I mean, it depends on really on the mindset. Okay. So if you are talking about, uh, I mean, especially towards the people at the fire movement, that is uh, very important because every penny safe is a penny towards early retirement. And yeah. You don't agree. <sighs> I used to agree. I wanted to be a millionaire by age 30 when I was young, but I had a near-death experience. Mm. And that kind of like changed my mindset uh, kind of like totally. In what way? Uh, actually, if you look at the news, I was, uh, I was also kind of like uh, interviewed quite a number of times about my medical condition. I, I even went on Channel 8, this, uh, this uh, Iliao Da Xiao Si to talk about it. I think this year, just, just a few months back, you can mm. still find it quite fresh on YouTube. Mm. Uh, and you, you realize that money is not so important when you are dead. Mm. Okay, so I had a near-death experience. I was very sick for close to five to six years. Mm. I nearly died. Uh, and after that, you will feel that, hey, you know, maybe what's the point of me maxing everything when you don't, get to spend it at the end of the day. Mm. And uh, why I, am I so like trying to ch save on food, on, on, on traveling, all this kind of thing, and torture yourself in a way. Uh, getting financial independence is good and all, but when you are not there to enjoy it, it's not something that you want to do. So after that, I kind of become more liberal and I, I don't try to, I mean, actually that, that kind of works for me. Mm. Uh, I remember I was sharing with the audience that I was like doing options kind of thing. I want to get rich by age of 30. Uh, I, I feel that, that that kinds of trip people up. The faster you try to succeed, uh, the faster you fall into traps and, and uh, look for uh, shortcuts to trading methodology. Uh, in today, uh, I'll say that the best way to work is to just do dollar cost average. I mean, I do that every month, I dollar cost average. And uh, create a portfolio, uh, invest for the long term. You will see something like a, a short term opportunity, like COVID. You know, I literally threw my buffer cash during COVID. I bought a lot of uh, a lot of uh, stocks during that period of time. Uh, but that comes maybe once every ten years. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't try to trade around the short things, the short uh, short news like elections or these kind of things, uh, or the trying to predict what the what the Fed is trying to do. I, I mean, I've been trying to do that for many years. Uh, <laughs> And many sometimes analysts I try it, to sometimes do that. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. Every shout is the same idea all day. Hmm. So, so I'll say that me maxing, I guess, uh, try to do as much as possible. But once it gets into your lifestyle, it rolls into your lifestyle and it rolls into your relationship, your uh, relationship with your family, with your wife, your children or your parents. It's not worth it personally. Mm -hmm. and, and if you do get sick, you, at one point in time, you realize that, hey, maybe all this me maxing, I'm, Time to enjoy the the fruits of all this mean maxing I've been doing. Mm. Okay, don't really go all the way or out. Go to stuff yourself on fire all the way. Uh, you have to learn how to enjoy uh, because we only have one life. I like that how I like how it went in a, in a very ideological direction. You know, which which I think is fair, right? Because prudence has been held up so highly in this whole fire movement, right? Like every penny has to go somewhere, you know, when I think more and more of our listeners and even more and more of the guests coming on recently has been talking about a slightly different view of this thing, right? Where it's about appreciating life and all that jazz. So, so that's good. Um, and are there any other games that you think like, don't waste your time, uh, like the mouse game or, you know, some of these other, other things? I mean, I do play the mouse game a bit because mm. I travel quite a lot. Fair. But these days, I look for lounges. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, how do I say that? Okay, because I guess uh, with the rise of like debit cards, like overseas debit cards, mm. uh, before that, I will look at, you know, when I go overseas, I spend my credit cards. Which one gives me the best multiplier? I buy like air tickets. Uh, what is the best way to get miles? But over time, when you look at all the the, the, the overseas like uh, Revolut, you treat all these kind of things, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. amount of savings you save on the bank charges and all the all the exchange rates, it's like literally I don't go money changer. I mean, I do still do maybe two 
I, when I go to Europe, I just change $200 sing, mm. and I just use my all my debit cards for every other things. Mm. And you, you'll find that, is it worth all that kind of, uh, all that kind of mean maxing? Mm. And, and personally, whatever that you try to go, more or less, it's just a bait. Okay, the rewards will be gone sooner or later, and you will be going for the next big thing. Okay, the next credit card and this kind of thing. You, and then they kind of lock you in. Your points are there. You need to point out your rebate is there. Now you lose the rebate. Are you going to sacrifice your current advantage to go to a new bank? Mm. So we have seen that happening, especially in the last few years mm. uh, when interest rates are higher. And you see a lot of banks like, like uh, giving up their rewards because they don't need anymore. They don't need to fight for all this. Uh, because they get better returns giving out loans and <laughs> <laughs> because last time those other BU is doing well yeah yeah other yeah. BU is doing well so they don't need that much reward so you yeah. see all the rewards is coming down and and I mean I, I talk to a lot of people people are going into using the debit cards because they don't see is it being a worthwhile using a credit card mm, to mm. get all these bank charges. So I'll say that I, I still look at it uh, now and then, but I'm not very hungover about the getting the best credit card, getting the best miles. Fair, so fair, 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 fair. And, and seeing what you've seen, how the industry changed over the 20 yeah, years, yeah. you know, what are the major games that you think everybody need to get it, you know, in their personal finance journey? Uh, I guess the major games is the most boring game. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it's the most boring game. I, I, I guess every... And being every, able to entertain it as a boring game is also a, a, a major challenge, right? On some level. Yeah, I mean, the discipline yeah, to keep, yeah, it, yeah, to keep yeah. it boring. Yeah, yeah. I, every market guru from Warren Buffett to uh, all the fund managers, I mean, okay, not really the fund managers, all those who are independents, the best game I still feel is dollar cost average. Mm, okay. Mm. Of course, you can you can learn uh, your technicals, your global macros, your modern portfolio theories, your fundamentals, all these kind of things. I, I've been through done that. I've explored everything. At the end of the day, it's up to your personal style. Mm. I mean, I've done technical. I've done trading, US, Singapore, Warren's futures, uh, but I cannot take the stress. Mm. And I've done fundamental. It's too slow for me. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. the value doesn't get realized, especially for Singapore stocks. Mm. And I was into China stocks mm. at one point of time, early stocks. It's like, you look at China stock, wow, value investing, big market, potential growth, makeup, everybody need makeup, under value, below NAV, mm. uh, potentially good dividend. This can't go wrong. It's a Warren Buffett stock. You go in, it's a fraud. Mm. Okay, mm. because what's the, what's the problem with fundamental analysis? Uh, unless you really talk to the CEO yourself, you cannot detect uh, director fraud. And mm. they cook all their books, you look at beautiful books, you buy in, you, they, they were like suspended and then you lose your, 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 that part of the portfolio. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so I've been through that. So at the end of the day, I kind of like end up as a global macro guy where I look at medium to long term, I trade uh, global trends and I'm pretty good at that trend spotting mm -hmm. as a personality. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like uh, work on that and I just DCA, which I feel is whatever is the trend that is. Mm. So I have my own flavor with a very boring game strategy. Uh, but at the end of the day, you need to find a style of investing. I'll call it a style of investing because everybody will be like, have their own religious tech saying that, oh, you know, my style is the better than your style. <laughs> fundamental is the best. Technical sucks. Then technical says that, you know, your fundamental doesn't get realized. Your undervaluation get realized. I now take the money, I lock in the profit and I diversify. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't take big bets. I, I'm in and out. I enjoy my life taking the profits. You're still waiting for your, your life <laughs> after 10 years. It's not realizing. <laughs> then, then the global macro is people or the modern portfolio theory say that why you all take all this effort just this year every day, buy an ETF and then forget about it, enjoy your life. Enjoy your life and don't try to be the market. Yeah. Because yeah, it's yeah. futile. Yeah. Uh, resistance is futile. Just surrender and just do this <laughs> I mean, there are different... The different style of investing, everybody thought that they have the holy grail. Mm. Uh, I can only say that you just find your own grail that works for you. And that is that is basically your game plan. Okay. And if you are consistently making profit of using your game plan, stick to your style, stick to whatever you're comfortable with and just uh, do it. And don't try some, I mean, you can try something new now and then. I mean, I'm, I'm doing crypto, losing money, uh, but making it back. <laughs> yeah, but I, it's not it's not a big chunk of my portfolio. Mm. My big chunk of my portfolio is still into a portfolio where I DCA every every month and I just dabble on the side uh, to test out, to learn and to see whether there's an opportunity now and then. Nice, nice. And and based on what you are saying, essentially it's about finding something that can consistently work. Yes, correct. That is the baseline of success yes, of what correct. works for you. Yes, correct. Right? It's not just how you feel, right? Because correct. sometimes when people say, hey, I just focus on what works for you, it's a bit feely, mm. right? But your to you, the baseline parameter is what can you hit consistently? Yes. 
Okay. And there's always this period of exploration. Mm, yeah. Mm. And that's why you lose money. That's why I say that when you start your so you're fair, right? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you must put some money in. Yeah. So so and and in in whatever you've shared, right? I, I think it probably encapsulates some things that you've talked about in your book. Mm. Right. Uh, would you like to kind of share a little bit about your book, the, the five, oh, okay. the five, five the, elements. yeah, five uh, elements. Yeah, so you've done your homework. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Of course, I've done my homework. Uh, okay. All the best. Uh, that was one of the. <laughs> That was uh, that was the time when I still got time to write books and uh. I didn't because now I spend a lot of time designing games and publishing games. So I can tell you're probably more excited with that. I mean, I don't mind going back to writing. Mm. Uh, uh, I mean, I I just uh, doing some writing or the thing, but really seriously, it's, it's writing is a lot of work. Yeah. And uh, and I might uh, I have a lot of friends who wanted to write books, uh, one of their dreams. Yeah. Uh, but maybe uh, yeah. Yeah. One day lah. One day. One day lah. Yeah, publisher okay, will talk happen, to you yeah. <laughs> uh, So that book, I think what I wrote is uh, based on uh, a horoscope. Uh, coming back to the style, is that different people got different style. I uh, like you have different jobs. Some people they like to do a. Uh, uh, extrovert like to do sales, business development, uh, but the introvert like to do data analytics, uh, codings, or uh, analysis. So it's the same thing as investment. It's like there are different styles that are suitable for different kind of uh, characteristics. So mm. some people who are more analytical, maybe they are better off doing the fundamental style. There are some people who are more extroverted, like you are like a Donald Trump. <laughs> you 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 do sales, you want big things, you are better off negotiating uh, property prices down, you can cut the buyer down all the way to give you a 30% discount, whereas the uh, normal people just look at the price and just buy off the price. Uh, they can negotiate better. So uh, they are, these people are better off buying property. So I kind of wrote a book about the different kind of characteristic, whether you are a fire element, you are a water element, air element, or earth element, with different kind of character, and the different style of investing, and which is a better way of uh, doing uh, investing based on your character. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I mentioned, there are different schools of thought and different ways of investing, uh, find what it works. And sometimes you have to first look into yourself first to find what kind of person are you and which kind of investment style is suitable for you. Sometimes you are just a person that cannot do numbers, cannot do data, uh, then that's the time you outsource. Okay. 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 Outsource means just uh, find someone, index you, know, down. Yeah, you yeah. may be a good salesperson. Yeah, uh, you yeah. can do uh, millions of dollars of sales, but you're just bad at yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, because yeah. you have no patience to look yeah. at the dots. Fair, fair, fair. And, and the title of the book is Keep Investment Simple and Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Five yeah. elements of successful investor, yes, but no right. longer in print. Uh, Can still find I actually, NLB. Actually, I, I, I did that in Malaysia. Uh, yeah, uh. So, I mean, the time Malaysia bigger market and more people read books there. I mean, at least as of now, I go back to KL, I see the bookstores there are still doing quite relative okay as compared to Singapore. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of look for a Malaysian publisher instead mm -hmm. of a Singapore publisher and it was published there. Uh, some there, are, there It was actually sold in Singapore for a while because like, you know, popular and MPH, they do have like, uh, the publisher have working with that. Uh, but yeah, it's out of print. Uh, mm -hmm. I still have a few copies uh, over there so I can still give one or two copies away. Yeah. Oh, you can go yeah. to the library. The library has a copy. Uh, I don't think the Singapore library doesn't have a copy. Have, have, have. Pongo oh, library. Oh, Pongo okay, library. Okay. <laughs> I was searching about it. I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So shout out to the National Library Board. <laughs> okay, okay, good. I, I, I really like some of the core ideas that that you have uh, shared, right? And some of these other things that you essentially just shot at it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I, I think the candor is much appreciated. I, I really like it. Um, so maybe uh, one, one last big question for you, right? Would be if let's say today you had to tell somebody that is, you know, kind of not very sure about their strategy mm. and their game, you know, what works for them, you know, in the personal finance space, yeah? So so there are many different things, right? Yeah, in the yeah, personal finance yeah. space. What would be your step-by-step -step advice to this person? You know, like how do you, because especially in a space where everybody's telling you they're right, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Every, how do you discern all this information? Do you have a thought process around this? you know, uh, to craft a game plan mm. for yourself or for whoever that you're advising with high levels of hit rate, you know? Yeah. I guess uh, having gone through the process uh, and, and looking back, I would say that firstly, you have to first determine uh, what, what's your strength and weakness. You come back mm. to your personality, seriously. Uh, there are some people who are much more analytical and uh, I would say, okay, uh, let's just sum up that there is actually four ways of investing. Uh, mm. This is the broad framework. So instead of like hundreds and thousands of things, I will classify them into four subsets. Uh, the first subset is the fundamental uh, analysis. That means it's the Warren Buffer style investing. Uh, you, look, you can crawl through all the 
data, you can look at 10 years of annual reports from companies and uh, you don't mind data, you love data, then that, that is one of the method. The second method is of course the technicals. The technicals are those people who are much uh, more energetic, the people who are on the ball, they like excitement, this kind of thing, and they have a disi the discipline to work through the, the all these things and they can diversify the portfolio without losing their trousers but because they are they get too confident and throw everything in one pot and the pot die. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that, that is the second way. The third way is the global macro theory. So that is the uh, Peter Lynch, the George Soros. You invest in what you consume, you look at the big trends, what are the up and coming markets. Uh, like uh, India, is Indonesia, uh, US tech with an AI trend going, uh, how long will this trend take? Will this be like the next like internet revolution? Like when we talk about technological revolution, there's a few big ones, there's a few small ones. The big one is like uh, internet and then uh, a mobile phone, which is kind of like a small one. And then the whole AI thing, is it a big thing as big as the whole internet that created the whole new uh, industry? Like if you look at S&P 500 now, the biggest uh, stock right now are all those that are tech, which 10 years ago, we'll call them risky mm -hmm. tech high growth stocks. Yeah, but yeah, now yeah. I call them a consumer staple because everybody uses Google, Google Map every day. Exactly. Yeah. I have a theory about tech stocks. Anything that the analysts don't understand and find hard to explain, they'll put under tech. Yeah, correct. <laughs> correct. Eventually, the tech will mature. Correct. Right? And yes. then once it matures, then they have a category called semiconductor. Yes. Consumer correct. technology. Correct. You know, so correct. it will move on. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, so, it's, so Warren Buffett is talking about uh, investing in consumer staples and things that won't go down even the internet goes past. Okay, kind of in the internet goes down, all this tech stuff will get into trouble. <laughs> also. But okay, uh, but I think in today's uh, internet infrastructure is quite difficult uh, yeah. right now. But I mean, to, to, to be fair, it's like like Google, Amazon, like uh, all, all this, like they have like taken over the traditional consumer staples. Uh, and and they are now the new new consumer staples. So uh, tech is another big story, but it's the new AI tech with regenerative AI, all this thing uh, becoming the next big thing that will change how people work, it will change the industry. Uh, yeah, so 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 that's the that is the global macro trend. Then the last one is I call it the DIY trend. So mm -hmm. you are you love your work, mm -hmm. you like to do what you want to do, and you look at funds, you look at stock you sweat when the stock dropped by 5% and you cannot sleep. And that's where you get a group of professionals to help you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's why financial consultants still have a job despite having a lot of DIY platforms, mm -hmm. robot advisory out there, and kind of things. Yeah, so uh, when people are talking about the new HDB, uh, buy and sell yourself, they say, oh, you don't need a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people who value their, their time and value their work, they will still get a consultant, they get a banker, they get a lawyer because they don't want to spend time to go do or do this to research themselves. So these are the four frameworks. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that uh, it's up to in individuals. You try this, these four frameworks mm. uh, and see whether you succeed or you fail. Uh, you try one first, you fail, you try the next one until you find one that succeeds. Mm, mm. Uh, and then uh, once that works for you, you work on that framework as your principal strategy, your principal game plan. And then when you're free or got time and you've got interest, you can go and explore the other framework again mm. and dabble and put a small chunk of your money and in, in it. And if it works and it really can make a lot of money, then you can decide whether you want to quit your job and trade for <laughs> Okay, for a living. Okay, okay, fair, fair. I, 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 I like that methodological uh, point of view, right? So, any last things you want to share with our audience, you know, uh, around creating a successful game plan, you know, maybe maybe something not in investment, mm. you know, like any, any last things you, you want to just give our audience? Uh, at the end of the day, I think for me, what's meaningful for you? Yeah. Okay, uh, for me, I think it's uh, about creating a legacy. Mm. So, I mean, to be honest, the tabletop industry is not, that profitable. Making mortgage is not very profitable uh, at this point of time. Hopefully in the future, it'll be like US and Europe, mm -hmm. <laughs> much more bigger market. Yeah, but right now- He's betting on a mega trend. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so right now it's like, like this one is more of a passion project. It's not really that a business that can actually make a lot of money. I mean, I'll, to be fair, it's, it's much easier to, to get a day job uh, and get a good salary rather than trying to make mortgage and selling it. The same for uh, podcasts. Uh. You know, today I join a big bank, I can take the whole department. Yeah, I know exactly inside correct, how to do correct, this. Correct, correct. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that, that, is, that is the that's the thing. But uh, I think uh, we'll 
become about a, a point of life is about uh, what is what is the legacy that you're leaving behind what is the meaning of your life uh, what is it that you want to do that you'll be remembered for mm. okay so in this case i guess uh financial literacy board is what i'm working on <laughs> uh on that is i'm looking for the meaning in, meaning in my mm. life so mm. once once i'm passed and gone i uh, hopefully this product will still be around in the market mm. and people will be looking back and say that hey you know this this fella did something interesting like, who is this fella oh is he like okay that's that's really good mm. so so uh, i will say that uh, making money is important uh because that gives you choices getting financial independence is important because that helps you uh, give you time to explore what is it you really want in your life mm. okay but at the same time uh, you can start exploring bit by bit and and find out what is it and then uh work towards it and if you can get your fire early and you can go and work on what is the true meaning of your life, I think that is uh, what is most important mm. and why we are here on the earth for. Wow. wow. Very good. Very good. Okay. Cool stuff. If let's say our audience want to get to know you, they want to connect with you, where's the best place for them to? Uh, they can Google Zeolai, I guess. <laughs> because <laughs> the uh, name is unique. Yeah, yeah, you unique. can't so, find any other. Uh, so that was, uh, that was uh, kind of like a mistake. Uh, yeah. Mistake as in, because every tele marketer try to pronounce their name, they get it wrong. It's either Xiao or Xiao. <laughs> my, my, my wife asked me Zeolai. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm Zeo. Okay, uh, that's right. Mm. So yeah, my, my wife even called me incorrectly when we first started dating. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh. So that's the curse. Uh, but the good thing is that I got my Gmail on my Yahoo. Yeah. Nobody, nobody, no, yeah, nobody only add zero me. ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't need to add my birthday behind or my date of birth behind to try to get my my, my preferred Gmail. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, so you can yeah, find me uh, using just Google me Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Thank you, thank you yeah. for your time. Awesome. And uh, we'll update you the the giveaway game plan. You know, follow our socials and then we'll take it from there. Nice, awesome.